Well, hello and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. Kevin, we sound a little bit different today. We are trained strange things. Yeah, yeah. We, we were able to get a little bit of an equipment upgrade, which is kind of nice. But now we have to figure out how to make it work. Make it sound better. So, theoretically, we sound better. Yes. But in reality, probably not. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to be the same content, too. It doesn't improve our content at all. Oh, I thought you bought the deluxe package that would help. No, no, no. That wasn't... The Cyber Monday package was not the deluxe one. Oh. Yeah. Nice try, though. Oh, well. But hey, if you appreciate what we do and want to support it, here at the end of the year especially, thinking of a year-end gift, your gifts are tax-deductible, you can head on over to crucialproductions.org slash give, and all that information is there. And Kevin, something else awesome happened last week. We should probably tell people about it. It's quite an amazing thing. Yeah, what, what was that amazing thing? We are now official. We are an official, recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I thought they were changing it to registered service We're organization. We're working on that. We're work- yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we have an official affiliation with our denomination, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which frankly is quite cool. So there are options and benefits that open up with that. But I'll, Kevin, I'm going to tell our audience what I told Dorothy in our interview, which is why, why are we doing this? Why would we pursue that kind of a relationship, that status with our church body? Well, the main primary reason is we want to be held accountable for what it is that we teach and what it is that we're doing. We don't want to be lone rangers going off and doing our own thing in our own way. Um, and we desire that accountability from our church body to tell us, make sure you're teaching what's right and good and in line with uh, the scriptures and what we believe teach and confess and we're keeping an eye on you to make sure you do that and we actually welcome that kind of uh what's the word accountability Scru- scrutiny. scrutiny that's the word i was looking at so yeah anyways we think it's exciting we're uh, looking forward to that relationship it, there's so many different words that you can't use that don't apply. I don't remember if that's one of the not word things. I don't know. RSOs are an interesting little thing. But anyways, We're an RSO. It's exciting. We're an RSO with the LCMS. So we've got more acronyms now um, that we can put on our name and whatnot. But today, we're not talking acronyms. We're talking Latin. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's not... I think that's even more confusing, Kevin. Probably. Yeah. But so, it's it's good. Yeah. Last week we started uh, talking about the three genera, the three genuses of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Is that the right way to phrase that? I'm sure. Still, I'm still yes. learning this as we go. Yeah. Uh, and right off the bat, I want to make sure that we're, we're setting the stage properly because once again, we're going to get into some deep waters here. But the reason we're doing this, as we mentioned last week, is not to be smart and to fully understand this because nobody's ever understood it before or any sort of arrogance, ooh, look at us, we can do this. But in getting to know these doctrines and how all this works together, we're getting to know our Savior. We're getting to know Jesus Christ himself and getting to know him better. And so the excitement in this and the joy in this isn't in the discovery and acquisition of knowledge, but in getting to know who our Savior is and what he's done, and in this case, how the church has historically talked about that and wrestled through some of these very confusing uh, brain pain theology. That's how we (laughs) talked about it last week. Mind-bending things, topics. So, Kevin, today we're talking about the Gainus Idiomaticum. Yeah. Did I say that correctly? Sure. All right. The good news is... There aren't really any living Latin speakers to correct you, so you can just say, oh, I learned ecclesiastical Latin versus classical Latin when they critique your pronunciation. Yes, I'm totally going to do that Right. whenever that happens. Yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about the Gainus Idiomaticum or any of the three genera of Christ, remember, it it's not that hard. It's kind of like we do with the Athanasian Creed. If you remember some very basic principles... It'll help you a lot as we walk through this. 
And I know we've been talking about this for several weeks, but it's it bears repeating that when we talk about Jesus Christ, we want to talk about one person with two natures. So we don't want to make the error of having two different persons, nor do we want to make the error of combining the natures or getting rid of one of the natures or something like that, or separating the or natures. Or alternating between the natures. We don't separate them. We don't alternate between them. We don't confuse them. We don't mix them. We don't eliminate one of them. Mm-hmm. We confess one person, two natures. Very similar to confession of the Trinity, where there's one essence or substance with three persons. Mm-hmm. So this is the whole deal, is that all of this discussion is trying to help us confess with the scriptures that Jesus is one person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. And that is why we can say that Jesus is truly God and truly man. Mm -hmm. And this is the orthodox, or if you want to use kind of an easier term, correct way to confess what scripture teaches. And I think that's the other important thing to note is that what we're doing here is attempting to only say what Scripture says. Yes. Or, to, or to talk about this in the way that Scripture talks about it. To not come up with different new approaches. Or I think one of the problems I, keep, I, continue, I still struggle with is, well, we can't say it this way because if we say it that way, then it must mean this way over here. That's kind of taking it from the reasoned approach mm-hmm. and trying to work our way back to Scripture. That's backwards. Right. We're trying to move forwards from Scripture. How does Scripture talk about these things and go forward from there? And right. so we're faithfully confessing as best we can what Scripture says. And, and just real minor point, then we need to move on. But we are faithfully confessing with the church. Yeah. <laughs> See, we're not out here all on our own trying to make stuff up. That's why we're using the Latin terms. That's why we're using old school terms and some of these things, because we are with the church in this. And we treasure that, Mm -hmm. that the church has examined the teachings of Christ. And the ones that we are advocating in the Book of Concord, in Lutheran theology, as we discuss these things, these are the terms that the church has said, yes, that's the right way to talk about what Scripture teaches about Jesus. Now, as you're alluding to, there are wrong ways to talk about it, and that's what we're trying to avoid, right? Yep. That's yeah. the <laughs> heresies or Christological heresies. So, And that's what we've been mentioning as we go along. So let's get to it. So as we think about this one person, Jesus, with two natures, divine and human nature, the, the question quickly goes to, well, how does that work? <laughs> So like not quickly immediately yeah like immediately. that is the next question that's the next Wait, question what how, how does this all work and the three genera are simply trying to explain how the scriptures present this now let's be very clear they are not mutually exclusive meaning yeah I was gonna say what? there are some things that you'll say this is the gainus idiomaticum. And then later we'll use the same verse and the same concept and say, and this is the Gainus Apotelismaticum. Okay. I'll say, wait a minute, it can be both? Absolutely. Because it it isn't, it's kind of like law gospel. When you first learn law gospel, you think you can go through the highlighter and highlight the law passages in yellow and then the the gospel passages in green or something, right? Right. That's not the way it works. I like red and blue for the gospel because it's either blood Right. Supper or baptism. Or baptism or something like that. So, yeah. But then you quickly realize that, no, that's not how it works. Because every passage contains law and gospel. Every passage, you know, and, and so every passage that teaches about Christ, it better kind of fit into these three genera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? You don't want any passage like, ooh, that one doesn't work over there. Because then we've made a mistake. Mm-hmm. So as we go through this, don't hear this as this Bible passage is assigned to this Gainus or genus, right? John John one one is only the genus idiomaticum. It is not for the genus uh, myostaticum. Right, something like that. Don't do that. That'd be totally messed up. But <laughs> yeah. So so as we do this, just kind of be aware of that. That a lot of the things that you, we do as we go through the three different genera, you're going to hear repeats, mm-hmm. and that's good. Yeah, that's very good. You want that. 
because the so, genera themselves talk about the two natures in Christ and how they work together and work with each other. So if you got verses that are working together and working with each gonna, other, it's gonna okay, it's gonna great. keep going in a circle basically. Yeah. <laughs> so when you get to the Gainus Idiomaticum, which is the first one, just remember that that this is basically discussing the attributes of each nature that they contribute to the person of Christ. So the person of Christ of Jesus how would you say it? it's it's so hard to say <laughs> but the attributes of each nature is contributed to the person of christ and you talk about that in this way you say when i'm seeing the human nature in something jesus is doing i say he's doing it according, according to. to his human nature mm -hmm. when i see him doing something that that appears to be the divine nature working it all out i say he's doing that according to his divine nature and what you're saying is the attributes of the divine nature is now apparent or the attribute of the human nature is now apparent but at all times both natures are contributing to the person of christ now last week we talked about there's different ways of numbering these mm -hmm. depending on whether you're talking you know reading peeper or reading chemnitz maybe others is this one always number it's always one? one okay this is always one so no matter who is doing it, it now I know Reformed also talk about yep. the genera. Do they call this number one also? Yep. Okay. Yeah, and they're and they're totally cool with this one, and they're they're pretty cool with um, Apotel's modicum too. It's the Maestatic Maestaticum, the one that they kind of question or, or flat out say that we made up. Yeah, we've got some departures there, and we'll get there. Not today. <laughs> so this actually the first gain is is, the, is easily understood. We do this all the time. And that as all good theology, you're going to crucify it, right? So we'll run right to the cross. Yeah. And the question is, when Jesus died, was it his human nature dying or his divine nature dying? Okay, that's like the huge question. I yes. mean, that, that is a huge question. It's one of the big ones because God can't die. Uh-oh. See, see how I operate? Then and you're I, not saved. Well, and I did this on purpose because this is going from the reasonable approach that we tend to do. Right. If we take it from that end first, are you trying to see my finger as I wait? No, I'm not. I'm microphone? trying to look at something on the microphone that I've never seen before. <laughs> Go ahead. Keep talking. They can't okay. see me doing this. Okay. Well, I can. To it's totally up. distracting. It's whole, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the the reasonable approach is well, God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's all powerful. All of these things, and part of that is immortal, eternal, everlasting. He can't die. So using, starting with my reason in this one, I'm like, well, look, God just can't die. So according to that, it must just be his human nature that died on the cross, not his divine nature, because God can't die. Exactly. So what you've just done, if you've, you've denied the divinity of Christ. <laughs> yeah, it you've, felt you've really awkward as I was doing it. <laughs> that Jesus can't be God because we've assigned God certain qualities and he violates those, therefore he can't be. Unfortunately for you, but fortunately for you, the scriptures disagree with you. Okay. And what they confess is that Jesus is fully divine and he dies on a cross. And this is the Gainus, uh, uh, Gainus Idiomaticum, is that we say the attribute of of the human nature which is mortal is contributed to the person of christ from the human nature and so he dies according to the human, human nature. nature but at the same time the divine nature is still present and active and therefore you can say as luther said god died on the cross you can say that can you can you say that his divine nature died on the cross you can say jesus you, you stop Stop. Jesus died on the cross, which means everything he did, he did with his human nature and his divine nature. That's the Gainus Apotelus Modicum. Okay. Wait, we just switched so, Gainus as Yes. <laughs> so idiomaticum is the assignment of each attribute of the nature oh. to the person of Christ. Apotelus Modicum says everything Jesus did to accomplish our salvation, he did with both natures active. Okay. So this is why they always work together. Because when you say he walks on water, well, that doesn't seem like a human, th a human, human thing. Yeah. That's a God thing. So we're going to say he walks on water according to his divine nature. Now, was his human nature on the shore 
waiting for him back and come back and get it. <laughs> no, it was cooperating. Or it the was human there. nature was in the boat ahead oh, of him. The, or and he jumped was ahead of him, up. right? Okay. No, we don't do this. And yeah. so what we say is, even though we assign it to a certain nature, we say, well, that is according to this. Both the human and the divine nature are always present and active in Jesus Christ. So I think the first time I can remember really encountering conflicts with this gayness without knowing that this is what it was, uh, was in talking with a friend who had been begun listening to a teacher who taught that when Jesus was here on earth, yes, he's fully God and he's fully man, but when he did his miracles, he actually, well, when he was here on earth, he completely gave up his divine power, never used it, never acted through it, but when he performed his miracles or the walking on the water, he used the power of the Holy Spirit right. that indwelled him. And that's how he was able to then do these, these miracles and everything that he did that was miraculous and divine. He did it through the power of the Holy Spirit, not his own divine nature. That, that seems to really conflict with this. We got some serious problems there, I would think. So... I don't know if the listeners will remember, but if you go back and listen to all of our old episodes, I have no idea when we talked about this, but we uh, yeah, did. I, remember, I know we brought it up. We talked about canoticism. And I think that's when we were like, oh, we're going to have to do the three yeah, genera. Do, <laughs> Christology that's why fully. I'm bringing it up again. <laughs> so this is a very common idea. I've heard this many times. I've heard pastors preach on this, whether they know it or not, they're saying this sometimes. Mm -hmm. That when Jesus did the miracles, it wasn't his own divine nature that was acting. It was the Holy Spirit because Jesus was just a guy. And guys can't do this. Or he was divine, but, you know, he's going to use the Holy Spirit. He put it aside or something. In this case, the impetus for it was, and therefore you as a Christian right. also have the, Holy, the same Spirit, Holy Spirit. And therefore you can do everything Jesus did. Which we're going to leave that alone for a little bit right. and just concentrate on Christology. We yeah. can pick that up some other time. But this is a very important discussion because while it has some truth in it, mm -hmm. it... As most discussions, it simply goes too far. Yeah. Does Jesus perform miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, sure. The Holy Spirit is not inactive during the ministry of Jesus. Like, he's just not hanging out or something. Remember, at Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and remains on him. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the Holy Spirit is active in the ministry of it, Jesus. This is actually part of our Trinitarian right. theology. That's fine. Like all we, three persons of the Trinity can be active and Yeah, working. we're not going to deny the Holy Spirit or something. <laughs> right. But to say that Jesus doesn't have his divine nature or doesn't ever use his divine nature, now that's going too far. And this does come from the idea of canonicism or the idea that, and that's the Greek word for empty. How do you spell that? Since this However, is a I want to spell it. <laughs> uh, in English, <laughs> I have to think about it in English. K-E-N-O-T-I-C-I-S-M. Okay. Kenoticism. So it starts with the K. So it's from the Greek word kenosis, which is to empty or the emptying of something. So in Philippians 2, he empties himself. And the false teaching was that that means that Jesus gave up his divinity. Mm -hmm. But the Orthodox teaching is that we are now talking about the state of humiliation. And in the state of humiliation, which Jesus lives in during his earthly life, pre-resurrection, he voluntarily refrained from the full use of his divine nature. He still has it, and is still contributing attributes to the person. That's the gainus idomaticum. Mm -hmm. It's still active in everything Jesus does. That's the gainus apotelismaticum. But Jesus willingly refrains from the full use of his divinity. So this is why Jesus can get hungry or can mm -hmm. get thirsty or can die or can not know certain things. I was going to say the not knowing everything. Or can yeah. learn, right? In the Gospel of Luke, he grows up before... In wisdom and knowledge. Right, in yeah. wisdom before the people. Yeah. And, and this is seen as a good thing. So how can God grow up? How mm -hmm. can God learn? How can God not know? How can God get hungry? And all of these things we say, well, in a Christological point of view, from the from the question of natures, we say he's hungry according to his human nature. But we also say that in the state of humiliation, he is voluntarily not using the full weight of his divine nature. And, and one thing I want to 
once again make clear as we're that that we're fully communicating all of this we speak this way because this is how scripture speaks i mean that's what you just said scripture says jesus grew in wisdom and knowledge okay in order to be consistent and confess what scripture confesses this is why we're going to say well according to his human nature yes he could do that even though he had has his divine nature alongside it or with it or oh i'm oh boy i <laughs> it's like uh-oh just I'm, say he I'm has divine in, nature yeah just has even though he has his divine nature as well um we're, not we're, as well i know i just keep has. using prepositional phrases yeah. is heresy in the prepositions a when lot it of comes times. to two natures in a Christ? a lot of times yeah so that's a good lesson for our listeners the heresy is in the preposition so be careful <laughs> yeah well I, i'm a prepositional heretic not really it's almost. okay though almost so so here this is what i want you to here we go i mean this is the way to do it first john chapter one verse seven but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another now listen to this and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin this is a christological passage which impacts all three genera. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And and we're going to look at it. We're not going to worry about the Ganus Maestaticum today at all. We're just going to pretend that one doesn't exist for yeah, a while. Yeah, we've already brought the Apotelus Maticum up. Right. So we kind of... <laughs> and remember, as we as we talked about last week, that that's okay because the, the Ganus Idiomaticum and the Ganus Apotelus Maticum both deal with how the two natures interact with the person. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Gatus Maestaticum talk about how the two natures interact with each other. Okay. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And we're, we're dealing with the two that both talk about how the two natures interact with the person. And remember, the point of all this is that Jesus does everything he does in order to accomplish salvation. Yeah. So this is a gospel pursuit. As a matter of fact, this is one of the coolest things about Chemnitz. He writes this ridiculously complicated book on this, right? I mean, it's just, it's insane. <laughs> Multiple volumes. He went. He wrote the first volume, I, th- I think, this is conjecture, this is me making stuff on my head, but this is the way I picture it, is he wrote it, he was like 300 pages long, and he went, no, that's too easy to understand. <laughs> let me try again. Let me make some, like it more complicated. Let, let me explain things a little bit more, which which is great because it's, it's like the definitive work, but it's hard to read. But he says this. He says the, the point of all this is not so we all become some kind of, you know, get some PhD in theology. No, he said the point of this is that people's consciences are comforted, that they know that God has accomplished their salvation. Hmm. See, and that's the goal of all this discussion. It's simply... So that we are totally comforted and and all of our hope and all of our trust is put in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's the point. So when you talk about all this, what's going on? What? How is Jesus doing this? What are these natures? What is this person? Well, it's all done to save you. Mm-hmm. This is all what God has done to save you and his son, Jesus Christ. So 1 John 1, 7. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Here we go. Jesus. Who is that? God's son. And Mary's son. Oh, yeah. See, before Mary gave birth, we didn't call him Jesus. So even the the use of the term Jesus means we're talking about the son of Mary. Okay. Which is yeah. a human. Yep. Right? Before that, it was Before Messiah, that, the Christ, the anointed the logos. one. Yeah. Really explicitly, it was the Logos, the Son of God. Okay. For us, we would say the second person of the Trinity, but that's not scriptural language. That's confessional language, right? Mm-hmm. But scripturally speaking, it was the Logos. Okay. And we get this from John chapter one, mm-hmm. which you talked about earlier. Yep. So in the beginning was the Logos. And then later in one fourteen, John one fourteen, the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, mm-hmm. right? So that now all of a sudden we have this Logos who's a person. And we've got to figure out what his name is. And then later <laughs> in one seventeen, it says his name is Jesus Christ, which is a crazy name because Christ is not a name, it's a title. Right. So this is Jesus, the Messiah, because remember, Christ is Messiah. So now when, when John in John 1, 7 says Jesus, his son, meaning God's son, now we have the earthly name of Jesus, the son of Mary, with the son of God. So now right away we have Jesus is man, 
Jesus is God, Mm -hmm. and then his blood, which seems really non-God, right, (laughs) cleanses us from all sin, which seems rather... That's pretty divine. Divine. Yeah. So in this one verse, we have all these Christological issues that we read it. And, and you've probably read that verse your whole life and never stopped and thought. Yeah, I never processed it that way. Is this the gain of cinematicum? Is this a game of you know? And And the answer is yes. It's all there. Mm-hmm. And that's great. Because this is the church's confession. Is that in this Jesus, there are two natures. And those two natures are always active in everything he does to contribute to our salvation, to accomplish our salvation. So he cleanses us from all of our sins. How? By the shedding of his blood, mm-hmm. right? So we have death and resurrection. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the person of Jesus doing this as God and man. And it gets even better, right? <laughs> and well, wait, there's more. Yeah, yeah, there's more. <laughs> it also leads us to this question. Is there a Jesus who isn't God? No. So was there a Jesus who wasn't God and man? So I, I want to pause real quick because the wrong way, once again, that I want to go about this is to say, well, no, that can't be possible because if there's a Jesus who isn't God, then that Jesus can't save us. Right. That's once again, take, and I, I always do that. I take the backwards right, approach. Right, take the backwards That's approach. That's like, no, there isn't. Because Scripture doesn't talk about one. Right. So is there a Jesus in Scripture that God at some point injects the Logos into? No. No. So Scripture simply never speaks that way. Right. It's simply the Logos becomes flesh. And this is the Annunciation to Mary. This is the birth of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The language of Scripture is that the only Jesus, I mean, there are guys named Jesus, but we're talking about this Jesus, the actual Jesus. Or Joshua. Or Joshua, right. Yeah. Jesus or Jesu, but this Jesus, the one that we are talking about who died on a cross, it, we want to make sure we don't teach that there was a Jesus guy that God came along late, later and put his logos into, mm-hmm. right? That's called adoptionism. Okay, yeah. That there was this guy named Jesus that God came along at some point and said, I really like you. I'm going to put my son, my son in you. Mm-hmm. Right, and then later might have taken him away or something, like when he died on the cross. Okay, yeah, but no, Scripture doesn't teach that. So in this one verse, Jesus, who is His Son, see, He's not Jesus who isn't His Son. There's only the Jesus who is His Son, and that Jesus, His blood cleanses us from all sins. So now what we're saying is, take it apart. When we call Him Jesus, we call Him Jesus according to His human nature. We call him the son of God, according to his divine nature, his divine nature, his blood, according to his human nature, cleanses us from all sins, according to his divine nature. That's the gainus idiomaticum. Okay. And it's that simple. You simply look at Jesus and you say, well, that seems to be like a human. And you say, okay, he is doing that according to his human nature. And you say, well, that seems to be something that God would do. And you say, okay, he's doing that according <laughs> to his divine nature. But at no time is the other nature dormant or something. Right, as if it goes away or stops right. acting. Yeah. It's just not the one you're seeing at the time. Yeah. So Jesus, John chapter 4, we all know that chapter. It's the woman at the well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it starts off with Jesus being tired. St. Fotini, apparently. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> sure. So... Um, it starts up. The story says that Jesus was tired. Yeah. Well, that's silly. So he sits down to rest and tells the disciples, go in and find food. He's eternal. He can't get tired. He's also hungry. Yeah. How can God get hungry and tired? That's just weird. So what do we do? We say, well. According to his human nature. Right. He is sure. hungry and tired according to his human nature. Yep. And then the, the the woman walks up and he knows everything about her. He knows how many husbands she's had. He knows that she needs living water. He knows everything. He knows where she lives. Mm-hmm. Well, how does he know that? Well, according to his divine nature. According to his divine nature. Walk him to the gainus idiomaticum. It's that simple. That's not that hard. <laughs> no, it, it literally is that simple. And so what happens is this helps us read the Gospels. It, it helps us avoid some of those heresies that we've been talking about where you want to divide 
like how you start at the beginning. Yeah. It helps us avoid dividing the person. It helps us avoid confusing things. And it's just what scripture says. It's just confessing what scripture it's just, says. It's just, oh, okay. And it's not, it's not forcing scripture to say something totally incomprehensible. Mm-hmm. It might sound like it is, but it isn't. We're actually just letting scripture read the way it's written. Yeah. Because, and this is the other move, is some people say, well, when it says that, what it means is there's this new nature that's created in Jesus, this God-man nature that we can't comprehend. And so there's this this mixture nature thing, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's this mixing of human and divine, and it's kind of weird. And we say, no, 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 that, that's not what it says. No. And then other people would say, well, what it means is there's actually two different Jesuses walking around, and you just see one, and the other one's kind of hidden or something. And I think what you're getting at with those is what it hasn't, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it hasn't answered how does this work? How do we actually, how does this actually, how does it work? Can I tell you a secret? Don't tell anyone I told you this. Kevin, we're. Okay, but there might be people you listening. just promise me you won't tell anyone. Okay, I won't tell anyone else. The Bible pretty much never answers that question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you if you walk up to the Bible going, well, how? Or why? If You can ask why God saves us. Because he tells us. Because he loves us. Mm-hmm. But you can't ask, why did we fall into sin? Why are some saved and some aren't? Why is it that way and not this way? Why did God choose to do it that way? And we kind of go, I don't know. The (laughs) Bible doesn't answer that question. It simply confesses to us. It reveals to us Mm -hmm. what God has done in order to save us. And I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating to me. (laughs) Yeah. Because sometimes you want to ask, ask, answer the why question or the how question. And And the how question for Lutherans... You know this as well as I do, Peter. You confess that you don't care about the how every Sunday. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because when you walk up to the altar and you kneel and your pastor says with a wafer in his hand. The body of Christ. Given for you. You don't say, "Uh, Pastor, how? (laughs) How is that the body of Christ? You don't. What do you do? I just receive it. You say amen. Mm-hmm. Which means, whether you say it out loud or say it in your heart, right. what you mean is, yes, I believe those words to be true. Mm-hmm. And why would you believe those words to be true? Because who spoke them? Jesus. Jesus. Mm-hmm. And he is the one who was God in the flesh to save you. And he says, This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you for forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And. We take him at his word. Mm-hmm. And the churches that spend their time trying to delineate how are the churches we look at and we say, huh, that's fun. Good try. <laughs> but I don't think we can agree with that. Yeah. Because I don't think that's in scripture anywhere. And that's, so they that's say, the main thing. That's you're saying something scripture doesn't actually yeah, so they, say. So they go, well, it, it transforms, the substance transforms, but the accidents remain. And we go, huh, that's fun. But that's not what scripture says, so we're not going to go there. They say, well, no, no, what happens is there's a new substance created, this this consubstantiation idea where they're kind of mixed in together. So I go, that's neat, but that's not what scripture says. Mm-hmm. Or they say, we can't figure this out, and the, the finite can't contain the infinite. I mean, that just makes logical sense. Which we're going to talk about with the Gainus Myostatic. Right. Yeah. So then when they say that, and they say, therefore, the Lord can't mean what he says, we say... We follow your logic, but whoa, you just crossed a line telling Jesus what he can and can't say. <laughs> or can I mean, and can't do. Right. And so yeah. I, I'll i be happy to die on that hill, right? That <laughs> I'm just going to take Jesus at his word. He has to deal with how. Right. How is he going to make it happen? I don't know. This is the God who said, um, let there be light. And the universe went, How? No, no, it just happened. <laughs> I mean, this is the I've God who creates. I've never done that before. How do I do How that? How do I do that? And and this is what we want to confess in all of this stuff is we say, Christ 
is Jesus Christ is he is one person with two natures. How? I don't know. Yeah. Well, he's he's God in the flesh. And and therefore we confess that the natures, both natures contribute their attributes to the person. And everything that person does, he does with both natures in order to accomplish our salvation. How? I don't know. <laughs> but that's the way it is. Right? So so in Acts twenty verse twenty eight, you know, it says the church is saved by the blood of God. Mm-hmm. Well, how? How does God have blood? And the answer is According to his human nature. According to his human nature, in Christ, he has yeah. blood. And you go, Whoa. You say, Yeah, that, that's it. Just confess it. Yeah. And if the fun thing is, and we've said this before, but this is the fun thing. <laughs> you walk up to a child and you say, Jesus is God. And he died on the cross for you. And they go, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and they kind of look at you like, doesn't everyone know that? <laughs> See, and and all of this boils down to the faith of a child where you kind of just read the word of God, you hear the word of God, and you simply say, amen. So are you saying that digging into the Gainus Idiomaticum actually helps us recapture the faith of a child that we once had? Oddly enough, yes. <laughs> this is while having thoughts that no child would ever actually have. <laughs> and and I, I really do think this is that the more you read theology, the more you're driven to simply saying, I put all my trust in what Jesus said and did. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to leave it there. That's why we keep saying we're simply trying to confess what scripture confesses. That's, we trust what Jesus said, and we trust his word. That That is what the faith of a child is, is simply trusting what he said and not saying, you know what? I'll trust that if you can tell me how. Right. Yeah. And that's why, you know, when we talk about we're saved by faith, even that is not an active thing in us. If, we're saved, if we say we're saved by our reason, or once we get this all figured out, then that's something I have to accomplish. Yeah. I have to reason all this through. I have to understand all this. I have to get all the Latin terms. Like, right. if I you've get... listened to this entire episode and still have no idea what we're talking about... It's okay. You, you can still be a Christian. Well, except for you need to understand the Jesus dying and forgiving sins well, part. Well, yes. But everything else... But you if you don't have the go, Latin words to go huh. with it, that's okay. Right. <laughs> and let us know. We'll try to do it again. Yeah. Better. But... Ask us questions. We like those. And this is also why we encourage every single person who listens to this, even if you only listen to part of it or only listen occasionally, go to church mm -hmm. every Sunday. Don't skip. Because that's where Jesus is for you in his word, in his sacrament. That's where you're going to gather with the saints around this word. And you're going to look at other saints who are going, I don't understand any of this, but I do believe this. I do mm -hmm. believe his words. And you say, yeah, me too. You'll see and hear the Gainus Idiomaticum all over your church yeah. service. Yeah. And now you'll know that's Isn't what that you're great? actually hearing. You're like, whoa. You could even cool. walk up to your pastor afterwards and say, I think he did that according to his human nature, if I understand the Gatus Idiomaticum correctly. <laughs> and your pastor will be like, yes. He'll, either that or he'll be like, um, we need to make an appointment and talk. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for somebody to talk theology yes, with. This is, is it great. you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts, Kevin, as we wrap up this episode? I think just the most important thing to think in all of Christology is that all of this is done because God loves you so much. He sent his son to die on a cross to save you. And this is how he did it. And we're about to celebrate that incarnation in a couple weeks. Here. That's what Christmas is all about. Yep. Christmas is actually about the Gainus Idiomaticum. In many ways. Whoa. And the Gainus Apotelismaticum. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up too because... Hey, that's the crucial conversation. So we'll be back next week, I believe, with the Gainus Apotelismaticum. Then we might be taking a break for Christmas, depending on how things work out. Yeah, we'll see. We're already there, almost. Wow. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time. See ya.